Dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, God's grace, His mercy, His peace have all been shown to you through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ by the powerful working of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So what are you going to do next? That is a question that has been directed to many graduates during these last couple of weeks. So what are you going to do next? And it's, it's probably a question that they have been contemplating themselves. For our eighth grade graduates, that question of what are you going to do next probably is an easy response, summer vacation. And for many of you, summer vacation is still vacation. You get to sleep in late. You get to go to camps. Maybe you do a little babysitting. Maybe you do some lawn mowing. Maybe you do some chores. But it's probably not all that serious a question. For our high school graduates, that what are you going to do next, that becomes a little bit more serious. For some of them, it means entering the full-time workforce. For others, it means entering the military. For still others, it means looking for a summer job or summer jobs until heading off to college next fall. And finally, for our college graduates, what's next might include finally applying for a job, maybe paying off some of those student loans, looking for a place to live, or maybe it just means going back for some more school. So what's next for you? If you think that's only a question that you get to ask and answer when you graduate, well, you've got something coming to you. Because isn't that really a question that every one of us asks ourselves multiple times every single day of our lives? So what am I going to do next now that I'm established in my career, now that I'm married, now that I have kids? What am I going to do next now that, well, now that I'm retired? What am I going to do next now that I'm looking for a new home or a new place to live? What am I going to do next after church gets done? That question of what's next is one that we contemplate and that we face often. So let me ask you this morning, how are you going to decide what is next for you? I believe that the words of Philippians chapter 1 that you heard just read a couple of moments ago are words that help us face those choices and make wise decisions. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that these words of the Bible are going to help you to choose which classes to take next year or which college to attend or who to marry or, or which hobbies to take on or how many kids to have. No, no, no. But I believe that these words of the Apostle Paul will help you when making the many decisions that you face throughout life. So that they are God-pleasing. So that they are wise and Christian choices. You see, the Apostle Paul, when he was sitting down and writing these words to his fellow Christians, he was facing the question of what was next for him. He was living in the city of Rome. He was under house arrest. And he was waiting trial. He had been charged, he had been arrested for supposedly riling up people because he was preaching that Jesus was the Son of God and a Savior for all people. And yet he was relatively confident that he was soon going to be released. And yet, hanging over his head was always the very real possibility that he might spend the rest of his life in prison and he might even be executed. And so as he began to think about what was next for him, he finally came to this very simple, simple conclusion. He said, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. For to me, to live is Christ. Does that sound strange to you at all? Don't those words at first seem a little bit strange to our human ears because isn't that the direct opposite message that the world around us and that the sinful nature inside of us preaches to us repeatedly? Don't those things tell you that your life is not about Jesus, but your life is about who? Your life is about me. It's about what I want to do. 
It's about what makes me feel good. It's about what makes me happy. It's about what I think is best for me. It's about what will make me more popular. What I believe will make me more successful. This life is all about me. And yet the Apostle Paul says just the direct opposite. He says, for to me to live is Christ. For the Christian life is, is all about Jesus. And why is that? It's because the Apostle Paul found in Jesus someone who met his greatest of needs. The need that every single person in this world has and attempts to fill and find in some way. You see, the Apostle Paul had been a very successful person. He had grown up. He was well-respected and well-known among his peers. In fact, you might call him a a kind of child prodigy when it came to religious instruction. And yet as he looked at his life, he realized that there was still something missing, that there was still something wrong, that as hard as he tried, he could not find something that, that completely brought him relief from the guilt of his sin. As hard as he tried, as many people as he could find that told him he was doing a great job, there was still always this weighing down of there was something wrong. And then Jesus found Paul. And in Jesus, the Apostle Paul found somebody who met that greatest need, that void and emptiness that sin had created. Someone who brought to him a peace unlike any other in this world. He found in Jesus somebody who did the unthinkable, nearly unimaginable, that Jesus, the very Son of God, equal to God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, would be willing to give up the perfections and peace of heaven that were rightfully His from eternity and into eternity. And that Jesus would be willing to give those things up so that He could come into this world and live as Paul had lived. Be born of a woman like Paul had been born of a woman. Be a child and grow up in a family just like Paul did. Go to school and come home from school with a snotty nose and the cold and the flu, just like Paul did and just like a lot of you have. Jesus came into this world and he experienced disappointments and frustrations. He experienced sadness and loss. You heard it in our gospel lesson for this morning. How Jesus' heart ached. When he saw that mother who had already buried her husband, now preparing to bury her son. In Jesus, the Apostle Paul found somebody who had come into this world and seen firsthand how sin had wreaked havoc on this world. A world that Jesus himself had created in perfection to bring him glory. It is Jesus who looked around and he saw people that were searching that were lost, trying to find and make sense out of this life while ignoring the one who gave them their lives. It is Jesus who saw people attempting to relieve the guilt and burden of sin with all the wrong ways and looking in all the wrong places while ignoring the solution that God himself had provided. In Jesus, the Apostle Paul found somebody who brought him true and lasting peace from the weighing guilt of not being perfect. Because Jesus had been perfect for Paul. In Jesus, the Apostle Paul found somebody who brought him relief from the fear of God's punishment that weighs over the heart of every sinner because in Jesus, Paul found somebody who took sin's punishment for him. And in the Apostle Paul, or in Jesus, the Apostle Paul found somebody that brought him confidence even when he stared fate, death in the face because Jesus had overcome death and promised that same eternal life to all of those who believe in Jesus. In Jesus, the Apostle Paul found somebody worth living for. He found somebody that was of such great value because Jesus had done something that Paul and nobody else could ever do. That Jesus had brought peace and purpose and the promise of life eternal. And dear friends, Jesus has done the same for you. 
That's the message that the children of our school get to hear on a daily basis and throughout the day from Christian teachers. That is the gospel message that we get to hear on a weekly basis as we come here to this place and hear of God's love. That is the good news that God has, high, uh, has, uh, has considered you uh, of such high importance that he was willing to give his life in your place also that you could share with him in the peace and perfection of his heavenly home for eternity. And so you and I who have seen that Savior and the greatness of his love, we too join with the Apostle Paul and say, yeah, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Christ is our confidence. He is our compass throughout life. In Christ Jesus, we find somebody to guide us in lives of gratefulness and in lives of glorifying. And if you're wondering what it means to live for Christ, the Apostle Paul actually tells you. In the verse just before this, Paul writes this, So that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Christ will be exalted. That word exalted, it has the word mega in it, magnify, to make big, to make larger. That as Christians, when we face decisions in life, when we're trying to figure out what's next for us, our goal is always to have Christ looming large. It is always to, to show to other people how great and important Christ is to us. That, that Jesus is the most important thing to us because Jesus has made us who we are. So that when you're thinking about what am I going to do next or what am I not going to do next, we are always trying to maximize Jesus. To show that he is the largest part of who we are. Are. And now just think about how that goal affects your life. When you start to consider what you're going to do next Sunday, will you see summer vacation as a vacation from church? Or will you instead decide to exalt Christ and gather with Jesus and his people around his word at every opportunity? What will you say next? When somebody says something to you that is extremely insulting, will you repay insult with insult, trying to make them feel just as bad, maybe even a little worse than the way they made you feel? Or will you decide to exalt Christ and hold your tongue in silence, take a deep breath, pray the Lord give you patience, and pray for that person? What will you do next when life's plan doesn't go exactly as you had planned? When sickness interrupts your retirement? When a relationship is broken because of unfaithfulness? When a bank account is drained because the stock market crashes? What will you do next? Will you walk away from God, despise Him, and get angry at Him? Or will you decide to exalt Christ and humbly trust His plans for you? knowing that even in the difficult, that he will use it for your eternal blessing. No matter what our decisions are, no matter what we do, the priorities that we set, our purpose is always to maximize Jesus. And maybe it helps to think of it like a balloon, okay? Here's the children's devotion part of this sermon, okay? Um, have you ever tried to fit a balloon in your pocket? It doesn't work very well, okay? Well, it, it can. You let all the air out of it, really easy, okay? You just let the air out, you stick it in your pocket, and guess what? You can walk around with that balloon in your pocket, and most people probably won't even recognize it. But you start blowing it up, you put it with some air in it, awfully hard to hide. And then if you really fill it up, put a whole bunch of air in it, good luck. Don't try putting this in your pocket. It's never going to work, all right? People are going to see that this balloon is really big. Is it the same for our Christian faith and our Christian lives? Every once in a while, doesn't life leave you a little deflated? You start to look at your life and, and you realize how you've failed to exalt Christ. The arrogance and the anger. 
the gossip and the greed, the doubt and the fear, and it leaves you feeling deflated and you realize just, if this keeps on happening, that faith, it's not going to get any larger. In fact, it's going to keep on getting smaller and smaller, a less and less part of our lives and who we are. And pretty soon, you're going to be able to hide it. Nobody's even going to notice it at all. That's why we need that constant refilling of the gospel message. To hear how Jesus has forgiven us of every one of our failures to exalt Christ. It is the Holy Spirit that does what? That breathes into us and increases our faith as he points us to the cross and demonstrates how vastly God has loved you. It is the Holy Spirit that keeps on breathing into that faith and making it larger and larger as he takes us to the empty tomb of Jesus and shows us that death for us as Christians is the greatest of gains because we get to share in the victory of Christ for eternity. It is that gospel message that you and I need to keep on hearing over and over again to fill us up so that we can live for Christ, so that we can exalt Him, so that we can reach that heavenly goal that far surpasses anything that this life might have for us. For us to live is Christ, and to die is just the greatest of gain. So let me ask you, what is next for you? Some of you might answer the Apostles' Creed and the offering. That would be correct. <laughs> but not all of our choices or decisions will always be so easy or clear, will they? And so my prayer for each of us is that as we face those decisions, that we consider them under the greatness of Christ's love guided in gratefulness to glorify God throughout our lives, that the Lord would guide you each and every day to live to Christ daily, who lived perfectly for you, so that you might live eternally with him one day in his home. May God grant it for the glory of Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen.